On the end of the cab, you see the roof arch, which is made of bent wood. And I have a feeling it was elm, uh, the original. Here's a piece of the original, which, as you can see, is pretty badly dis uh, rotted. In fact, when we dropped it on the floor, it fell apart. Uh, very fine, tight grain. It was steam bent. You can see the grain goes parallel with it. If you had tried to cut a piece like that out with a bandsaw, you would end up with short grain on either end and it would have no structural strength. Whereas when you steam it, it's quite strong and basically that holds this whole end of the roof together. We had thought we might preserve the original, but as I say, when I took it off, it, it just uh, fell apart. So we don't have a wood steamer here. Uh, which is the way they would have done it originally. They would have put moist steam in a wooden box and it would have uh, softened the wood up. It takes about an hour to the inch was the old way of the old rule of thumb. And uh, what we did was we boiled it. We put it in a piece of pipe with a propane flame underneath it and boiled it for about an hour and a half. And it was soft enough so that we could bend it to that, nearly that uh, amount. But let's look at a couple of extras. We made three, one for insurance in case one broke, which they didn't. So inside the cab you see a form which we traced off the old one. We calculated uh, about what the angle should, or the bend should be, and then we bend it quite a bit sharper This on these two so that when it springs back, as it does, no matter how much you bend it, it will should be pretty close to the original. And those are made out of ash, which is the kind of wood that we have, and they did use. Ash is very tough, and it bends quite, uh, quite readily if you boil it enough. Now, one thing that you have to do when you bend something is you have to keep the grain from breaking out at the, on the outside. And when that does that, it'll just crack and break right through. So what we do is we put what's called a tension strap. This is a piece of thin steel, which is wrapped around on the end, goes all the way around to the other end of the piece, and is wired in place so that when it bends, it can't go anywhere because it's against the steel. And we've had, through bitter experience, we've learned how important they are. Now this has been on here for probably close to a month, and I expect it will, it should be uh, pretty close. One thing we'll do, we, we'll put clamps up on it, and we'll pull it one way and pull it the other way, and it will eventually conform to just what we want for the right shape. That you see, the old, old piece was the edge of the roof sheathing, and we found that because this had been uh, tacked, there were too many nails in it, and it had split to the point that no more could be put in it. It's tongue and groove, and if you look down from the top, you can see the piece that was spliced on. What we did is we sawed off the old piece, and I sawed it uh, as far out as I could before getting into all the nails that were in it, and I knew it would ruin the saw if I went across there. And I put a new piece glued it right to the side of the remains of the original and it goes all the way along and it will be a very solid piece to to uh, nail to or to tack to. The roof canvas comes over the edge down to the bottom of the unpainted area and then it's tacked every inch or so. Then over that is a piece of half round that's a trim piece that protects the edge. Now that trim piece was completely gone and the only evidence of it was that there were nails that were inch and a quarter long which were much longer than you, you would use, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, uh, uh, that you would never have used for tacking and I figured there must have been some kind of a molding there which, which is long gone. I have a feeling that Seashore might have taken it off when they put the canvas on the roof originally. And, uh, what we confirmed that by looking at old photographs of 100 in, as late as its very last year. And there indeed was a piece of molding that covered everything. So we're going to have to make a piece of half round. We'll do that. Now, we also
also found that the lower piece was uh, split and wasn't really doing anything. They had made a couple of repairs in it along the way, and I decided it would be better to put a brand new one on that would uh, be solid. So we have replaced that with a piece of ash, and it's the other thing was that the ends of the ribs were broken off. They were not doing anything, so the piece was just sort of hanging up there. So I chopped off the remains of three or four of those ribs. I can't remember how many exactly. And using some scrap pieces remaining from the original arch, there was enough wood in that so I could make new ends out of the old wood and put tenons on the end so that they would go into mortises in this piece right here, put screws through the end, and now it's much more solid than it ever was. At the very end, looking back here, you see a little decorative piece inside. Actually, I'm not quite oh, at the very end. Yeah, right here. Back up. Yep. Uh, there's a little decorative piece which really wasn't very structural. Yep. Well, we made mm -hmm. it structural by putting a four inch or six inch screw right, drilling right through it and boring into the frame of the car so that it held it down solidly. The nut that you see and the cast iron washer is a truss rod that goes from one side of the car to the other and kind of pulls everything together. The reason that the support piece uh, goes out beyond the end of the car is because I didn't want to cut it till everything was absolutely the right length. And uh, I also had to use it to pull everything into shape because uh, the piece, the, I, I had mentioned that the arch piece on the end wasn't quite bent sharply enough, so when we put it on, it tended to force the roof straight up. And so when we, in order to get it straight, we put a cable and a chain around the end of that and then down to a sawhorse and pulled down gently and then put a clamp across the end of the car and ended up pulling the whole thing into shape and it's now straight and very solid. What, there's okay. half a new piece glued to one of the old pieces. Yep. Then there are two other pieces which I took off and the reason I did that is because I wanted to make sure I could get at the ribs which were underneath and also to scrape off all the paint which was many, many layers which, which was underneath them. So um, the, there's two and a half pieces of original there pulled out. We cut the nails off, pulled them out as best we could and then renailed them. The ones on the outside I put down with screws because the ribs that are sticking out are so short that I was concerned if we started pounding on them, they would break off. So instead, we screwed the roof down whereas, uh, on the sides, whereas the original was nailed down. This roof has had a lot of patching on it, and we'll see some on the other side that was probably done by Seashore, and I have a feeling that uh, some of the center part also was. So it's hard to tell. In, in the, it's uh, many years of operation, there were lots of patches done by a lot of people. The cab is held vertically with truss rod, in fact, here's one right here, that go from the top, just under the roof, all the way down and through the sills of the car. There are ten of them. One at every end post, and then one on in the middle of each side. So there's four, there's four here, four on the other end, and uh, two in the middle. The uh, the top of the post, or the top of the truss rod rather, has a big square nut on it which is set into the top of the frame and then the roof was put on over that. Well, when we uh, had to move the cab off of its deck, so to speak, we moved it in here and uh, the, we had to cut all the truss rods with a saber saw, steel sticking down through here. And we moved it over and set it down. And we set one of them on the sawhorse, and it had the effect. It was sticking down a little bit. It had the effect of pushing the rib, the roof up. And I was wondering why there was a big space there. So we've since re, uh, moved the uh, whatever was interfering, and the roof was then pulled down. So it's correct. Now you can see the end of the. I, I don't. I can't remember what that is. It isn't a tack molding because it isn't what you tack into. But anyway, the support for the edge of the roof. And you can see the mortise for when we put the new rib end, our new arch across the end. It will go in there and then
there's another one on the other side. The other side is original, this one is new, and we'll saw it off when we get everything in place. Uh, the ribs, the, the other thing that is interesting is notice the thickness of the roof. It's about seven-eighths of an inch thick, which is thicker than most any other car. They're usually about uh, half inch, seven sixteenths of an inch thick, quite thin. But for whatever reason, they they thought that they had to make it uh, very heavy. Uh, the other thing it, you notice is the boards are uneven in width. There's wide ones and narrow ones, and there's one real wide one which they put a uh, groove, a decorative groove in the middle of several of them here. And they were just doing that to um, use the wood that they had. We found that also on the sides, that the materials are different widths. They took a board and uh, put the tongue on one side and the groove on the other, whatever width the board was. If you were to go to a lumberyard today, everything would be all the same. Another thing you want to notice is the uh, gouge right here in the end of the, uh, this uh, fascia board, I guess you could call it. Something had dug that up and they had nailed it back together and I suppose we could have patched it so you didn't know it was there, but I thought it was an interesting piece of some traumatic piece of history. I don't know what happened, but something definitely gouged it and dug it all up. We removed uh, many layers of paint here. Uh, we found some things that were uh, a little interesting here. I'll talk about that in a minute. The wire that you see, the big heavy wire, is the main wire coming down from the trolley pole and going down to the circuit breaker whose handle you can just see. That's what turns the power on and off to the motors uh, underneath. There's another little wire coming down and that all you see remaining here is just the ends of it. They had changed this. at one. When the car was built, it had one trolley pole on it. And when we, uh, toward the end, and it was the last year or two of its life, they put a second one on. Apparently they changed things in Sanford, so they needed a second pole to be able to get in and out. And uh, we have changed it back to one pole, so that meant the wiring was a little different. So there's cut off bits of wire there under the center, and then over uh, to the left, uh, is another one, and that one apparently fed the auxiliary circuits because you can see the other end inside and it goes, used to go to a fuse box, but now it's just a six inch piece of wire which we left there as part of its history. Another interesting bit of the history is over the window you see the uh, sort of a quarter rounded edge of the top of the window frame and grooves in it. Well that wood is uh, poplar, which is a fairly soft wood. And when they ran the trolley, the trolley pole would have been up and out this direction, uh, about 10 feet. And there was a rope that went up to it that uh, you could pull the trolley rope, the trolley down when you wanted to change and go turn, pull it around and go the other direction. They had no trolley catcher, which is like a reel, a fishing reel that would have uh, pulled the rope down. They didn't use them. Instead, they just threw it inside and when they pulled on it, it rubbed against the top of that window and created those grooves. So that's another confirmation that uh, we found there were trolley catchers on it, but I think Seashore had put those on because it never had them. Now, looking at the old paint layers that you see there, and we've, we've left several samples. This one will be fairly well concealed because the, uh, the bell, of which you can still see the framework, is here. Uh, went there. You see the green. That was a latter-day green. Uh, that was put on by the Atlantic Shore and its la or the York Utilities Company between 1948 and 49, somewhere in there. It's a, just a thin layer and it's the only green that was on it in, in this area. Seashore then painted the whole trolley with green, with certain exceptions I'll mention in a minute. Uh, and uh, a lot of people thought this locomotive was green all its days, uh, but it wasn't. It was green only just a little bit of its life, uh, probably two, three years of it, and that's all. Then underneath it, we found a brilliant, or, or a, no, excuse me, we found a cream layer, 
cream or yellow, it's hard to tell because it's somewhat deteriorated, a thin layer. Then under that, a bright red, a cherry uh, fire engine red, everywhere, except certain uh, areas I'll talk about. And then under that, we found a mud brown. And that was a very thick layer, as if it had been painted several times. Then under that, we found a black er uh, area, or in some cases, a white primer, probably white lead primer, uh, and then uh, the bare wood. Uh, but there was this red all over it, and we don't have any photographic evidence of red being anywhere except on the panels underneath the windows and on the all around the uh, hoods that run on the end of the car. So we've left these samples here. The other uh, color that we see is that kind of a tile red, which is up under the roof, and that, for the most part, seems to be what was there all the time, except for primer, and I've left a couple of samples of that. The primer was probably gray about the color of this. So what we did on this and the outside of the car was we scraped off with many, many layers of paint that were on it uh, and with a methylene chloride paint remover made by Savagran Company. It was SI5, which is their strongest um, industrial type paint remover and it was a lot of work but uh, we were able to get it down and then sand it fairly smooth so it came out quite well. We're not going to try to give this a, a uh, the kind of finish you'd have on a passenger car where they put, put a lot more time in it. Some of the pieces of wood we found were loose um, and so we've taken them right off and we're going to re-nail them. This is, you can see this one, and they had treated the wood, uh, you can see some kind of a brown primer. You see that on the roof boards, and you see that here. And this may have also been glued on at one point. Uh, that looks like the remains of glue here, though. And I found it in the joints elsewhere. Uh, let's see what else we have to say here. Uh, I, did you look down on the roof boards? I guess we yeah. talked about that. Yeah. This bell uh, uh, frame here that held the clapper is that ball-shaped thing there. And then uh, there's a rope that goes through inside the cab, and to ring the bell, the uh, motorman or engineer would just pull on that rope. There's a very neat little uh, wire wrapped around it and soldered, uh, which is what holds the uh, rope to the, uh, to the bell frame. And I thought it was kind of neat. I hated to cut it. I mean, eventually I probably will because we'll sandblast that and I'll see if I can duplicate it as nicely as they made it. Uh, this one has been sanded, and this is ready for paint now. This is where there was a uh, uh, step to go up. This was an abandoned grab rail that was used only uh, for a couple of years, but the, you can see where the, the bolt was that held it. And then there was another step on the edge here. I took them all off so we could sand things down pretty well. Looking at the side, uh, the paint, the, the old paint had shrunk a great deal. And these dark areas are where Seashore's last paint job went right back to bare wood because the original paint had shrunk and peeled so much that there was bare, bare wood showing. Uh, and it would give one to think, well, maybe there was green at the beginning, but if you took it off as I did, you'd find that uh, that was very recent paint. Some areas we found the dark primer. This seems to be right close to the wood. Uh, this kind of a gray, a whitish primer. Hard to tell. But we'll take these boards off because we have to get at the uh, the rods on inside of them, and uh, we'll be able to fasten them down better because they're kind of loose. This is just all the piles and piles of paint that we took off. The frame of the car is done. The wiring and the air piping is done, so that meant we could do the next logical step was to put the deck on. The deck from one end to the other was a tongue and groove oak, approximately two inches thick. Because the locomotive lived outside most of its life, I don't, I, in fact, I don't think they ever stored it inside, but uh, it's just my feeling. Uh, the oak that was outside of the roof hood, which stopped right here, 
had deteriorated to the point that it was all taken off and replaced, and I think it was by Seashore. They did use oak, but they did not use tongue and groove, and they nailed it down in a kind of a crude fashion. We were able to salvage the wood in, within the cab, even though it's somewhat beat up, it does have the footprints, as you can see, of the original operators. And the wood under the hood, which is this area right here, and especially this end, was well preserved because it, it had the air compressor here and it leaked oil, so it saturated the wood to the point that there was no rot at all on it, or no rot, significant rot anyway. And so we will use that area, the center of the cab, a little bit on the other end, um, hood on the other end, and then this right here will be original. This gray piece is a part of the frame to which the cab goes, uh, is, is anchored. We had to destroy the original partly because it was um, not very good to begin with and also because it's the only way we could get it apart. But we figured out what it should be and there it is. Now, we did know that the side that the uh, decking extended some distance beyond the end of the cab. And we had done a lot of measuring back and forth. And what we finally determined was that it would overhang. And I'm going to measure it so we'll know what we can do. About one and three quarter inches from the sill on both sides. And we went back and forth until we came up with a compromise that the decking that we had would line up with this piece that tops the sill all the way around. And then the decking, which was cut to a specification of length, will be exactly long enough and we will trim it all along. Now, one of the things that we had to do on this decking was, you don't see it in the picture here, and I don't know whether we have shown that or not, but there's all kinds of bolts sticking up here that had to be, uh, we had to carve the back out. Actually, Phil Morris had to chop mortises out in the back so that everything sat level. And then we uh, decided on the, the, like the other wood we were talking about the, uh, on the cab, these were irregular in width. Now when Barnstormers made it for us, I think they ended up with a with two different widths. Um, one was four and five eighths inches wide, and the other was... Five and an eighth. Or five and like five. Oh. Okay, five. And then we had a wider piece yeah. here, which is about eight inches wide. Yeah. So by going back and forth and, and trying uh, various combinations, Phil Norris was able to come up with this. And then we forced it all together, and eventually we will nail it down as it was originally. What we have to do, uh, oh yes, and we also, uh, when the original was pulled off, we had done a lot of measuring, and he actually photographed the tape measure which was very handy when we put things back to know exactly where things came out. We, we could measure from the, where the front of the cab was. We knew that because we knew exactly where this piece was to where the end of the underfloor would be and to get at, at this stuff here. Uh, looking at this stuff, it looks pretty rough. And in some ways, we were a little disappointed with the quality of this, but I guess we didn't have much choice. Uh, that there are defects in the floor. So what are we going to do about it? Well, first of all, we're not going to do anything yet to this side because we want to put a waterproofer on all of this because we can find no evidence of any paint that was ever on this. And whether they put linseed oil on it originally or creosote or what, we don't know because there's no traces whatsoever. But what we will do with an epoxy with some wood chips in it, we will fill these up level. And then we'll turn all the boards over and we'll put uh, Cabot's number 1000 um, water-based um, transparent, it's not a stain, it's a waterproofer, uh, I'm sorry, waterproofer. And we'll put that on the back side and then we'll put it on the front side. I didn't want to put it on first because it would be, it might interfere with whether the epoxy would stick or not. So um, when we're done, everything will be smooth and nice. Now it wouldn't be a dance floor quality, but it'll certainly be uh, as good as it probably ever was when it came from Laconia. You can see all of the uh, mortising that was done by Phil 
there was actually mortising in here already from the previous life that this would have, but this is too clear for all the bolts that hold this end together. And there was this was done here, and then at the bolster, which is about four feet in from the end. That square opening is where the kingpin goes, which goes down through the middle of the truck. And there'll be a little metal plate over that as it was originally screwed down. <laughs>